This morning, we're focusing on parents. If you are a parent in this room, I'm sure that there's no greater joy in your life than your children. I love my kids. I love reading to them. I love playing with them. I love spoiling them. I love picking on them. I love picking up my son and throwing him on the bed and wrestling with him. Um, I love when they show up in the middle of the night and kick me out of my bed. Um, It can be annoying, but sometimes I enjoy that. I know that that's not going to be there for a long time. So this season of my life where I have little kids, I totally enjoy that. But I'm learning that kids are not a big deal in our culture. They're often taken for granted, ignored, or considered a nuisance in our culture. I mentioned this in a previous message, but I was... If I was walking down the street with my two kids and there were people coming toward us from the other side, more than likely they will cross over to the other side of the road to avoid my kids. Unless my kids were in a stroller, then they'd want to come and pet my kids as if they were some kind of animal or something. But if I was walking down the street with my two kids, the people would avoid me and go to the other side. However, if I was walking down the street with two dogs or two pets, people on the other side of the street will probably cross over to come to my side so that they can pet my pets. That's the way our culture views and values children and pets. There was a study that came out recently from Indiana University that urban dwellers, city dwellers like most of us, are more likely to call our dogs our babies than to actually have babies of our own. Another study published a few years ago in the Journal of Children and Psychiatry concluded that an estimated 98% of children under the age of 10 are remorseless psychopaths with little regard for anything other than their own egocentric interests and pleasures. Talking about 10-year-olds and under. My two-year-old, my five-year-old is a psychopath, apparently, according to these guys. I know that when I speak to a lot of you guys in this room this morning, um, a lot of you don't have kids. A lot of you can't even find a spouse yet, so kids aren't even on your radar. Um, But you, one day, will get married, God willing. One day you will have children, God willing. So there are a couple of reasons why I want to tackle this topic this morning. Number one, this is preparation for you guys that are single or without kids. Like I said in another message, in marriage, the moment you get to the front of the aisle and you say your vows and you say I do, God doesn't supernaturally zap you and automatically make you a um, super husband or a super wife. The same thing with parenting. The moment your wife comes to you with that little stick and it's two blue lines God doesn't sap you and make you into a super parent at that moment. It takes time. It takes preparation. You need to be changed before you get to that point. Also, this topic helps you look for certain qualities in people if you're single. If you're looking for a spouse, the things that we talk about this morning are qualities that that person should have, male or female, especially if you want to have kids in the future. For those of you who are married and have kids, this is an encouragement to you guys that do have children. Number four, this is to encourage and challenge you that as we understand the Bible as a community and a church, the role that you play in the lives of the kids that are part of our church, part of our community, whether it's here on Sunday morning or on Tuesday nights or any other time where we invest into the lives of kids, the role that you play in them. And finally, to teach you about discipleship. Every one of you, whether you, if you know and love Jesus, whether you're single, married, have kids, or don't even want to have kids, should be involved in discipleship. You should have someone that's pouring into you, someone that you look up to and are asking questions from. You should also have someone beneath you you that you are pouring into, someone that you're trying to pull up, encourage in their faith, teaching them, training them, pointing them to Jesus. That process should always be going on in your life. Ultimately, parenting is discipleship. It transfers over. Everything that we're going to talk to you about today, this morning, in terms of fathers and mothers, is the same thing that you're to do for one another as you disciple one another. And before we jump into the text, we're really only focusing on one verse this morning. Verse 4. So it's really, really short. And you know me, I'm not going to let you get away with a 15-minute message. So I need to add a little bit more to it so that you get your money's worth. Obviously, in a few minutes, we're going to take offering and you're going to pay to be here. Um, So I'm going to make sure you get your money's worth this morning. So I'm going to start off by giving you some things that I robbed from another pastor. I'm giving him credit, so I'm not lying and I'm not plagiarizing. It's a guy by the name of Tim Keller out of New York, amazing pastor um, that's doing incredible work in the city of New York. Um, He did a phenomenal sermon called It Takes a City to Raise a Child. 
It's online and you have to check it out if you are a parent. But I'm going to summarize his message just as an introduction because before I deal with the how of parenting and what you're supposed to do, I want to encourage you of the advantages of raising our children in the context of which we live in, in the city that we live in. Raising children in a city like Dallas or people of different ethnic groups, of different religions, of different backgrounds, different faiths is extremely challenging. It's challenging when both parents have to work to be able to pay for the bills of home and, and the bills at home and they're not there to raise their kids. It's a challenging environment. We live in a very transient city. Our church is very transient. People are here for a period of time and God moves them to another city. We have people that have been part of our church for months and are now living in hard parts of the world like New York or India or San Francisco. Um, we had folks that are students at UTD and they're here while they're um, st students and then God moves them to wherever God takes them next. However, for a lot of us, Dallas is home. We've placed our roots here. If you've tried, ever tried to build relationships in the city, you've learned that relationships in this city take a lot of time. It means a lot of hard work. We started this church specifically so that we can reach people who don't know Jesus or love Jesus and bless the city that God has placed us in. We're not simply a gathering place. We're here so that we can bless the city that God has placed, here, placed us in. And the longer we are here, and the more we get involved in our city, the longer, the greater the impact we will have on our city. And I wanna give you a couple of advantages of raising children in our city. Let me give you a couple of disadvantages. It's costly. It's cost, costly to raise children in this city. Stats say that if you want to raise a child from birth through the age of 18, if they were born in 2010, it'll cost you a quarter of a million dollars per child to raise a child up to the age of 18. Multiply that by two kids or three kids, you're talking about a lot of money. It's a lot of expenses on raising children. Those kids who are younger, diapers are expensive, baby formula, all that stuff takes a lot of money. As they get older, all they want to do is eat, 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 and that's where all your money goes. And it's expensive to raise children. It means that you got to travel around a lot with them. And the city is congested. It's traffic all the time. And you got sitting in the car with them a lot of places, taking them to different activities, getting involved. It means all of your time is consumed as you invest in your children. But there are some advantages, and I want to give you a few. Number one, exposure. One of the greatest advantages of raising our children in this city is that we're raise, basically raising them up in a real world. What I mean by that is that they see life as it is, the good and the bad. When they are raised in a multi-ethnic and multicultural city like ours, they see a glimpse of what the world is like. They aren't raised in a bubble where everything is perfect, but they're raised in a culture where they see both the good and the bad of society. There isn't a week that goes by where my kids don't see someone on the streets begging for money, a homeless person. It affects them and they ask questions and there's conversations that I'm forced to have with them about what caused that. Why can't they find a place to stay? Why don't they have money? Isn't there people that will help them? There are conversations I'm forced to have with my children as they live in a city like ours. There are always things out there that are opportunities to teach them, just real life things right in front of them. There are things out there to talk to them about. There are things out there to say, hey, listen, don't look there. Don't look at that. Don't engage yourself in that. There are some conversation that goes on. It's a constant opportunity to teach them about life and sin and brokenness, but also to teach them about the gospel. Number two, involvement. I said you've got to spend a lot of time with your kids. We live in an urban environment, and we have to be heavily involved in the lives of our kids. We're involved in their activities at their schools. You're involved in their learning, what they're hearing, what they're being taught, what they're understanding, all of those things you are involved in. It's a great opportunity for interaction, involvement with kids, and the culture in which they are raised. It draws you closer together as a family because you have to be involved in their lives. Number three, rapport. There's a certain sense of rapport built with your kids as they grow up in an urban environment. As they continue to grow and mature, your kids will begin to realize how hard it is for people to live for Jesus in our city. Because your kids are watching everything that you do and everything that you say, they will know whether what you believe is really how you live. They see it. They need to see your faith lived out. If you say you love Jesus, you need to live your life out for Jesus. They see you get tested. They see you get tried. They see you get in traffic and watch your response. They listen to your conversations with each other 
and with other people. They listen as you talk about church on your way home from church. They see it lived out on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure you see that in a rural area. I'm sure that cows get in the way and there's traffic and people get mad, but it's not like the city. Number four, resourcefulness. Raising kids in an urban setting makes them very resourceful. They learn how to navigate through life circumstances. They learn how to relate to different people from different cultures, from different social economic backgrounds, from different family structures. We have a diverse community in our city. And as they grow up, they get connected with people in a global sense, from people from every nation, every background. Number five, appreciation. Raising our children here in this city helps and um, exposes them and helps them appreciate the different cultures that are around them. I grew up where it was instilled in me that my culture was important. It was most significant. It was of absolute value. I've heard people say that my culture was the best, that it was our job to avoid people of other cultures. So everything that was done, even in a church setting, was designed to keep us within the context of our church and more importantly, within the context of my culture. That's good and good if your primary concern is about community and culture. However, we're a church that believes that we're called to take the gospel to all people, to all nations, to people of different ethnicities, to diff people of different backgrounds. We also believe that God is sending the nations of the earth to us, that they're coming to us. No longer do we have to go overseas to do a missions trip. They are here. People from every nation live in this city. I long for the day where I can walk in here and see that there isn't a predominant race or ethnicity group in our church, but that as we live out our faith and live out our mission, as we point people toward Jesus, that people from every nation, every tribe, every people group will come here and we would have a mosaic of what heaven would look like. That it wouldn't be about culture, it wouldn't be about our ethnicity, that it would be about people that love Jesus, serve Jesus, follow Jesus, regardless of what their background is. Growing up, I knew I was Indian from a very young age. I also knew what other Indians looked like and I only hung out with them. I mean, I can look back high school years, middle school years, elementary school years, all of my friends were Indians, most of them from my church. However, my kids are completely different. We had to beat it into Nicole that she was Indian. She didn't believe that she was Indian. I, I don't think my son even knows today that he's an Indian son. He blends in perfectly, does the same thing that everyone else does in this school. It wasn't the same way when I grew up. My parents wouldn't let me get involved in sports because they were more interested in us staying in church and within the context of our culture. My kids are involved in sports and activities with people from other backgrounds. I grew up Indian, eating Indian food two to three times a day. My children eat Mexican, Thai, Chinese, Indian, Ethiopian, Italian, American, Mediterranean, occasionally homemade. They eat all of this stuff. They grow up appreciating different cultures, different people groups. And some of you say, wait, I don't like that. I don't, that's not what I want to be. You kind of need to know that this is where heaven is going to be like. This is what the new earth is going to be like. I honestly do not believe there will be ethnic groups when we get to heaven. It's not going to be like we get up there and all the Indians are on one side, all the Americans are on the other side, the Chinese are on the other side, but we're going to be a mosaic. It's going to look absolutely stunning. Chinese people, Indian people, American people, African Americans, everyone together worshiping Jesus. And we're called to represent that in our city. We're called to be that in our city. All right, that's just an introduction, sidebar of why it's important and advantageous for us to raise children, for us to even live here in this city um, as we live out the gospel. Let's deal with the text this morning and get more into the how of parenting. We're going to deal with some relational issues, how we're going to, we're going to deal with anger and passiveness and other issues of the challenges of parenting. Let me read the verse to you, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The first thing you have to do if you're going to be a godly parent is you're going to have to enlist. I'm going after you guys for a second. It says here, fathers. We know so far Paul talks about from the end of chapter 5, he begins by talking about you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are dominated by the Spirit, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you have the Word of Christ living in you, it begins to flow out of you and you become a person that is singing, that's worshiping Jesus. 
You become thankful instead of bitter. You become submissive and serving one another. And that bleeds into your marriage and your family where the wife is submissive to the husband. The husband loves the wife as Christ loves the church, willing to die for her. And they reenact the gospel in their marriage and they resemble Christ in the marriage. All of this happens when the gospel begins to flow into your marriage. Then he begins chapter 6 and he addresses fathers. He addresses men. Some commentators will say that when he says fathers, he's talking about men and women, and there's, by implication that's true, but he chooses the word for fathers. Verse five at the, chapter 5 at the end, he talks about fathers, um, a man leaving a father and his mother. He uses the Greek word for father and mother, but in chapter 6, he only uses the word for father. He's talking to men. When he gets down to it, he says, fathers, you need to be there for your children. Very particular that he uses this word to address the men. Why? Because you're needed. Guys, you can work, you can provide for the family, you can do make sure all the bills are paid for, but your primary responsibility is to be there for your family. It is the father's responsibility to raise, nourish, train, and teach your children. Do not chuck that off to your wife, do not chuck that off to your church, do not chuck that off to your school. It is your responsibility to raise your children. That doesn't mean that the mom is not heavily involved in it, but oftentimes we men pass that off to our moms and play no role in the spiritual growth of our children. You need to enlist. You need to be involved. If and when God makes you a father, you are held responsible for their lives before God. This is a testimony of the work of the gospel in your life because it goes against the very grain of what culture teaches. Most men in our culture are more interested in simply having sex with women and impregnating them, but will not take the responsibility of being the father to these children. This is the type of men in our culture and our city, but that is not the way the gospel calls us to be. More than 1.7 million children in the United States today have fathers who are in prisons. 1.7 million. That's an increase of 77% in just the last couple of years. 60% of births of women under the age of 25, dads are not involved. They're gone. 60%. A couple of years ago, VH1 came out with a show called Dad Camps. It only lasted one year. But the premise of the first season was that there were six expecting couples. And in the first show, in the first opening premiere, they take the expecting dads and show them birthing videos. They show them what it's like to give birth to a child, basically to scare the life out of them. And that's what they show these dads. Then the show gives these men a night on the town. They pay for them to go to a bar. The women stay home and talk about the challenges of now having to have a child and raising children while the men are out drinking and partying. The women stay home. The men drink, drink heavily. One is a complete mess. One flirts with anyone of the opposite sex in the bar. One ends up kissing someone at the bar. All the while, the cameras are playing, and there are, um, significant others are later going to see this. One of them is a chronic marijuana user. One is routinely unfaithful. One is completely committed to his video games, and that's all he does. Even at the bar, he's sitting there playing video games on his phone. They come home to the girls. The producers show them the tape of what the guys are up to. The girls get mad, and one dad responds and, this is, and says this to the camera. He says, look, my kid is going to love me whether he likes it or not. I'm going to keep smoking weed. I'm going to keep getting high. I'm going to keep drinking, and I'm going to keep going out. That's what he said. You probably need to ask the question, who needs the diaper and the pacifier in that family? Probably not the baby. Another reality show, MTV's 16 and Pregnant, Dr. Drew asked the girls who had, um, who had their, asked these girls, these 10 girls, who still had their birth fathers present in their life. Only three out of the 10 girls, the fathers were still active in their lives. We looked at this passage earlier in Proverbs, but we guys, we need to memorize this verse. Proverbs 17, 6. The glory of children is their father. The glory of children is their father. What does that mean? What is of most significance? What is of most value to children? Is not what you give them. Is not the home that you provide for them. What is of most important to your children is you. It is you being there. It's you being involved. It's you investing your life and time into them. That is what they need. They need a dad. Many of you know from personal experience what it means to not have a dad or to have a dad that was present physically but was checked out emotionally and um, everywhere else in the home. He invested more in his job, his friends, or the church than he did with his family. 
We're the byproducts of a generation of fathers that were super busy trying to provide for their homes that they did not have time to be fathers. And I'm not blaming them. Please understand that. However, we can be better. We can. Oftentimes, the fathers that do stick around are passive and weak. There was a new research that was done where there's a, apparently a new disease that's called postpartum dads. You can actually go to postpartumdads.org and learn more about it. The issue basically is that men feel abandoned once the mom has the baby, and they're now calling this a disease. One guy on this site, he says, before my son was born, I had the expectation of joy. I thought I would sail through this whole process, but it was like a wrecking ball in my life. Not even 48 hours after returning home with our newborn son, a truth dawned on me with shocking force. My life was gone. Movies, sleeping in late, long showers, all gone. We became slaves to this new thing, living in our home, and there was no going back. I ceded nearly, I ceded nearly complete authority to my wife. In other words, I don't want to do anything. I'll let my wife do everything, and I'll wear the skirt of my home. I'll blame both her and my son for my feelings of loss and insignificance. I, I took on every paternal responsibility which sucked up reluctance on the outside, contempt on the inside. My wife seemed to consider me selfish and irresponsible. She was tired, she would say, of parenting both of us. One day, I sat on the hardwood floor next to my son, both of us exhausted. My son started crying, and I did too. Actually, we bawled. I have no idea why he cried, but I was mourning the loss of my life as I knew it. This is why men are running away. They have postpartum. This guy actually said this, and it's posted online. This is why they're not sticking around, apparent, according to this study. The reality is that they don't have postpartum disease or um, syndrome. They have Peter Pan syndrome. They just don't want to grow up and be a man. Paul in this passage is telling you that with all of the authority that God, he's saying, telling you dads that you need to grow up. You need to put, you need to put away your childish ways. You need to be a dad. Stop playing around. Stop being irresponsible. Get serious with your life. Some of you are thinking, oh, I'll get serious when I finish college. And you destroy your life now. Spend all of your time playing video games without getting an education. You maximize all of your credit cards, and now you enter into marriage with debt beyond that you could ever repay. You spend seven years trying to finish a degree that you could have finished in four years. And Paul's saying, grow up. Be a man. Act like men. People in the world need men who love Jesus. Women are looking for men who love Jesus. Your children want men who love Jesus. Enlist. Be the man. Be a father. Number two, encourage. Notice Paul says, do not provoke your children to anger. Some of you parents are not. You are very good at frustrating people. Some of you have the skill of frustrating people. You know what buttons to push, and you push them. And you like pushing them. You can irritate people like no one else. Paul says, do not provoke them to anger. In other words, be encouraging to them. Be appreciative of them. Love them. Push them. Encourage them. As a parent, you will find that you are very good at provoking your children to anger. I'm amazed at how many times my daughter slams her door because I tell her no for something and she gets mad. It's easy for us to provoke our children anger. The idea here is the word of frustration. One of the ways you do this is by you abusing your authority or throwing your weight around too much. There are some fathers out there so very authoritarian that you destroy your children, your family, your friendships, the people around you because you're hard-nosed. You have no grace in you at all. All you have is a bunch of rules and no one ever seems to live up to those rules and expectations so you judge all of them and you're hard on all of them. No grace at all. This is like some of you at work. You're at work and you have your manager there and you know you're better gifted at the job than your manager. But they look down on you. They treat you like dirt. They're on a power trip because they have a title and they're going to throw their weight around. This is the idea that easily slips into parenting. You can easily get the title and begin to treat your children as employees or slaves, expecting them to meet your demands instead of being children. See, if you were in the culture that Paul wrote this, you would understand why this command was very important. 
because they saw children as nothing more than slaves in that culture. The Roman law provided fathers with complete, absolute authority over their children. He could sell his son into slavery if he wanted to. He could even have his son killed if he wanted to. When a baby was born, it was put at the father's feet. If the father picked up the baby, the baby was welcomed as a son or daughter into the home. If the father left the baby there, it would be the responsibility, it would be the other's responsibility to take the child, sell him into slavery, or eventually into prostitution. The father decided if the child was going to be a part of the family or not part of the family. There was a letter that was written that was found by a husband to a wife in 1 BC. He said, if it's a boy, let him live. If it's a girl, expose it. Basically, leave her out in the field and let her die. Another writer says this, we slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad cow, we plunge a knife into a weak cow, children born weak and deformed, we drown. That's Roman culture. That's who Paul was writing to. This is the culture that Paul was engaging in. And he tells them, listen, don't provoke your children to anger. Father, stop provoking your children. Stop treating them like little slaves. Stop treating them like dirt. They are human beings made in the image of God. That's what Paul is saying here. We're not that bad in our culture, but we're going that way. Where children have less and less value in our lives. This is why Paul says stop provoking them. Your child the people that you are involved in around you, the people that you disciple, your coworkers, your roommates, your friends, can become frustrated and have an angry disposition toward you because you just order them around and you don't give them opportunities to grow, opportunities to make mistakes, opportunities to blossom, and you begin to do, eventually begin to do everything for them and it's frustrating to them. Not that you just tell them what to do, but you never let them do anything. And you never give them opportunities. You never give them a chance to grow up and learn. You never give them, you give them the proverbial fish, but you never teach them how to fish. This is frustrating to anyone because they're never trained. Now they're easily provoked to anger. And they grow to regret you when they're older. See, this comes mostly when we fail to keep a balance of what Paul says next, which is discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Some of you are heavy on the discipline side of things. You like telling people what to do. There's a certain sense of authority and power you like, and you like ordering people around. You're overbearing, intimidating, harsh, and just plain mean to some people. Your goal is not to crush them. Your goal is to cultivate and re release them to duplicate in the lives of other people. Your job is not to crush your children to make them into your image. It's to cultivate them. Others of you are heavy on the instruction side. You're like counselors. You're there to give them some words of insight. You're their friend. You have no form of authority or responsibility for their life. You just kind of speak kind words into them. You encourage people to death, but you never correct them. You never tell them what they need to do. You dialogue, explain, counsel, but you never push them and challenge them to be what God has called them to be. You're cowardly and you're frustrating your kids and the people around you because you need to love them enough to sometimes tell them what they need to hear. Maybe not what they want to hear or what's comfortable for them, but what they need to hear. If you over-discipline your children and don't counsel them, you forget that they are not animals, slaves, or robots. You forget the doctrine that they are made in the image of Jesus in the image of God. If you under-discipline them and over-counsel them, you forget that your children are sinners, born sinners, and um, raised in an environment of sin, and that you need to correct and point them to Jesus. You forget that they need the counsel of God's word and of what to do and what not to do. There's a balance. You need grace and you need truth. And the Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. And that is what you're called to do as parents. Give them grace. They'll fail, show grace, but point them toward Jesus. You're called to be extremely gracious and forgiving, but truthful, even when they don't want to hear what you have to say. That's the balance that we need to keep. Number three, we need to enforce. Bring them up, dealing with the discipline side of things. Bring them up as the idea of being careful of not keeping them too dependent on you and being careful of not pushing them off too early. It keeps the balance between the two. That means parenting is to take them along with you in life. Same thing in discipling. When you disciple someone, it's teaching them as you go. The idea of discipline here is the idea of rearing and discipling a child through structure. They need structure. They need rules. They need discipline. You're a fool if you think they don't. 
There are times you need to say no to your kids. You need to give them clear instruction. We looked at this from the book of Proverbs, but he says that if you don't give your kids discipline, you basically hate them and you desire for them to die. True love for your kids is shown in your discipline. In terms of discipling and friendships here, it's good for you sometimes to step into someone's life and say, listen, you're screwing up your life. Don't screw up. Stop making mistakes. Some of you are more concerned about your friendship than you are about a person destroying their lives. If you are a true friend, you will speak honest truth to them when they need to hear it. The point of discipline is not to be an end of itself. It's not to make them perfect children. The point of discipline is to show them their need for a savior. That's the whole point of the law, isn't it? We can't keep the law, so we need a savior. It's to show them that they can't meet up to keeping the law. Sometimes you will quickly realize as a parent, something that you will quickly realize as a parent is that your kids will fail miserably when it comes to keeping the rules and the law. Timothy's of the age now where his favorite thing to do at home is to beat up his sister. He'll do karate chops, flying kicks, jump off the sofa and tackle her, knock her over, everything possible. And we warn him over and over and over not to do this. The other day he made the comment, Daddy, I'm really nice to her at school and play with her there and I'm friends with her there, but I don't know why I like to beat her up at home. That was the statement. That's the point. They can't meet God's standards, much less mommy's standards and daddy's standards. It's to point them to Jesus, point them to their need of a savior. Number four, educate. Not only discipline, that's one side, but to instruct them in the Lord. This is the positive teaching of children. The idea is counsel, warn, admonish, encourage them from scripture. You don't just lay down the law, but you instruct them about Jesus. To not instruct them about Jesus is sin. To not instruct them is sin. Do not depend on the church to instruct them. Do not depend on a Christian school to instruct them. Do not depend on the kids ministry to depend on them. Don't depend on other people. You as, your, as a parent need to instruct them in the instruction of the Lord. This goes for your roommates, your friends, your coworkers, your family members. You should be the one pointing them toward Jesus in every circumstance. If you don't tell them about Jesus, there are a thousand other Jesus, other forms of Jesus out there all around them that they will hear, and it will be a different Jesus from the Bible that will escort them straight into hell. You need to instruct them about Jesus. They need to hear the truth of who he is from your lips. Some parents think it's loving not to tell your kids what to believe. They don't want to impose their faith on someone, especially their kids. That's not loving at all. That doesn't even make sense. That's equivalent of me saying, I'm going to take my kids to 75, Highway 75, and stand there and put them at the edge and say, all right, now figure out how to get to the other side. What am I going to do? The moment I see them stand there, I'm going to yell at them. I'm going to scream them. I'm going to warn them to stay away from the cars. Why? Because I love them and don't want them to die. And I don't want to go to jail. If I love them, I will tell them what's true. The same thing is true about Jesus. This includes biblical principles. It's not enough to tell them stories about Jesus or other biblical characters. They need to know what the Bible says about living life. How do you make wise decisions? How do you honor your parents? How do you handle money? These are things that you as a parent need to teach your children. You need to teach them discernment and to think like a Christian. It also means that you don't expose them to everything out there. There's so much stuff out there that your kids don't need to see. It means you as a parent take responsibility to protect the innocence of your children. You guard them. You watch them. Let me read you a portion of a biography of a man by the name of John Patton. Most of you have never heard of him before. He was missionary to an island full of cannibals. In fact, the missions organization that sent a missionary to this island before they dropped this missionary off, before they could even set sail, they saw the cannibals come, kill the missionary, burn them, and eat them. John Patton felt like God was calling him to go to this very same island. He went, and he has an amazing story that God uses him to bring the entire island to Jesus. And he writes a biography. Basically, it's all of his journals. Uh, and he writes, they compiled it into a book. And it's an amazing, amazing story. The first hundred pages of his biography deal with his parents, the influence of his father, and why John chose to live the way he lived. Here's what he said. 
He said the very discipline that our father passed on to us was kind of a religion itself. If anything really serious that required us to be punished, father first went into the closet for prayer and we boys got to understand that he was laying the whole matter before God. That was the severest part of the punishment for us to bear. I could have defied any amount of penalty, but this spoke to my conscience as a message from God. So we loved him all the more when we saw how much it cost him to punish us. We were ruled by love rather than fear. Later on, he talked about when he was going to college, his father and him were taking a walk, and his father knew that he would never see his son again because John wanted to go and be a missionary eventually. His father watched John walk off into the horizon. Patton said this, I watched through tears till his form faded from my grace, that hastening on my way by the grace of God, I committed that day to live and act so to never grieve or dishonor such a father or mother that God has given me. The appearance of my father when we parted has often been in my life and in my mind throughout whatever I did. In my early years when exposed to temptation, his parting form rose before me as sort of a guardian angel. It is deep gratitude that let me, lets me testify that the memory of that scene of my dad standing there fading away that keeps me not only from prevailing sin, but also stimulates me in my studies that I might not fall short of all of the hopes and dreams that he has for me and all of my Christian duties that God has for me, that I might faithfully follow his shining example. What an amazing testimony of the impact of a father and a mother on their child. See, what I want you to know this morning is that there's something that stands in the way of that. And it stands in the way of that for all of us. The character flaws that are in our lives, if there's something that stands in the way of us becoming what God has called us to be, it's our heart. There's something in there that takes the place of Jesus in your heart, and the Bible calls them idols. We all have our own idols, all of us do. These things come in and ruin our affections, and they ruin your heart, and they cause you to be angry. The problem is that most of you are more concerned about your kingdom or yourself than you are about the kingdom of God. You're more concerned about you than you are about your wife or your children or your husband or your friends or your coworkers or your family. You're only concerned about yourself. You sit on the throne of your own heart. You can't truly parent. You can't truly love people with the idols that are in your heart. Idols like comfort. You just want to be comfortable. And you do everything possible to make your life comfortable. The idol of respect. You just want to be respected. And you get angry or devastated when you're not given respect. The idol of approval is around you. You want everyone to approve of you. You want everyone to accept you. The idol of success. That you will do anything in the world to succeed, often at the cost of your family and your friends. The idol of control. You want to be in control of everything. And when your kids disobey and they don't do what you tell them to do, you lose control of that idol. When things are out of control, you feel out of control. You will never change until you understand the gospel. This is why we emphasize the gospel here every week. Because only the gospel can change you, as a believer or as a non-believer. You need to know that you are more sinful than you ever imagined. You sit here and you say, I'm sinful, I have sin in me. That's just nothing compared to how sinful you really are. You are sinful more than you can ever imagine. You need to know that you are broken beyond imagination. You know you're a sinner, but you're worse than that. You're so sinful, so broken, that God himself had to come and live the perfect life, take your place on the cross, take your sin, take your punishment. You're so sinful that God had to die for you. That speaks to the depravity of your human heart. No matter how good you are here this morning, you're depraved. You're so sinful that Almighty God, perfect God, had to die for your sins. At the same time, at the same cross, in the same incident, you see that you're more loved than you can ever imagine. You say your wife loves you, your kids love you, your husband loves you. But on the cross, you see an unconditional love in which you will never see before where you see God himself willing to come and die for you. God didn't send an animal. God didn't send another person. 
but he came in the form of human flesh, born in a, in a manger, walked the walk that you should have walked, lived the life that you should have lived. He was perfect. If there was one person that deserved all of our praise, all of our worship, if there was one person that deserved all glory and honor on earth, it was Jesus. But he willingly forsook all of that, went to the cross because of his love for you. On the cross, you see how great of a sinner you are. On the cross, you see how deeply loved you are. See, if that is what matters to you most, that you have been accepted by Jesus, that you have been approved by Jesus, that your life is in his hands, that he is in control, that your identity is now in him, that you are now a son, a daughter of God, that you, have, you don't need the respect of other people because you have the acknowledgement of your father. If that is what guides you and rules you, you can deal with people. You can have a changed life. You can be changed from the inside out. You can raise your children when they frustrate you. You can realize that you're pointing them toward Jesus and you can be encouraged as you raise them. But when it's not, when it's all about you and it's all about yourself, you'll fail miserably, you'll keep provoking them to anger, you'll be more concerned about yourself. Live out the gospel. Live out the gospel in your life. Understand every day when you wake up that the only reason I'm awake this morning is simply the grace of God. That this morning as I woke up and got out of bed, I'm more loved than I deserve. And as I look to the cross, I realize that I'm a bigger sinner than I can ever imagine. But thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. This parenting thing is extremely difficult. It is extremely challenging. But he doesn't leave you to your own to do it. Because when Jesus died and resurrected into heaven, he promised that he would send his spirit. And he did. The moment you were converted, his spirit comes and takes residence in your life. So that now, every decision you make, God's there to guide you. As you try to raise your children to follow Jesus, God's there to help you. As you try to disciple your roommates or your friends toward Jesus, God's there to help you. He is with you every step of the way. This morning we come to the table. We come knowing that we're not here because of anything good in us. We're here because of Jesus. We're here because of what he did. And we come to the table in absolute humility, in absolute worship, thanking our Father for sending His Son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can sit here this morning forgiven, accepted, called children of God. I ask you this morning, would you examine your heart? What are the idols that are in your heart? Is it control? Is it the need to be respected? Is it the need to want the approval of other people? Or is it Jesus? Does Jesus reign in your life? If not, would you take a moment and would you repent? Would you let the Holy Spirit work in your life? And would you come to the table acknowledging your brokenness, but also acknowledging hope because he's still working on you and he is faithful to finish what he started in your life? Father, as we examine our hearts this morning, would your spirit convict us of any sins in our life? Would you show us things that are not like you? Would you make us more like you? As we acknowledge our flaws, as we acknowledge our weaknesses, would your spirit enable us to be what you called us to be? Help us to be better parents. Help us guys to be better dads moms to be better moms. Help us to be better roommates. Help us to be better friends. Help us to be people that love Jesus and it's shown through our lives. Would you remove all idols from our life? Would you make us more like your son, our savior, our elder brother? We love you. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name.